over the last uh, few weeks, as you know, we've been uh, looking at uh, the story of the foundation of the church at Philippi. Um, John and I were talking <coughs> a few weeks ago about wondering what God would want to have us do during the autumn. Um, and we were reflecting, actually, we've done quite a lot of thematic preaching over the last couple of years. We've talked about the kingdom of God, great stuff. We've talked about what the household of God looks like. Uh, we've talked about what it means to live by the Spirit. All good stuff, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, but we were aware, we have, it's a while since we've, we've sort of gone through an extended passage of Scripture, done some expository preaching. Uh, so you just, you have to look at the awkward bits, you can't go around them, because they're the next bit, it's the next bit in the book. Um, so we thought um, <coughs> we would look at, uh, having looked at the foundation of the church of Philippi, it made a lot of sense to look, to look at Philippians. Um, yeah, to look at that book. Except it's not a book. It's a letter. It's a letter. Do you know, that's important. There's something deeply personal about this letter, the way Paul writes it. He, it's from a particular person to a particular group of people, and we've met them. You know, we've met Lydia. We've met the, the slave girl who was released from a, from, from a, from a demon. We've met the, the, the jailer. Uh, we've met some of these people. Um, and, uh, you know, we, 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 we've had a bit of an introduction to this, this church. Probably a house, it was a house church, we meet in a hall like this, met in a house, un undoubtedly. <coughs> and we met some of them, okay? So we're going to read this letter. And I, I want to say right at the beginning, let's not forget the writer behind the letter. He's a flesh and blood man of God who feels the things deeply. It's a very passionately written letter. A um, bit of background, um, it was uh, probably the, that bit in Philippi we looked at for the last, over the summer was somewhere around 51, 52 AD, something like that, 20 odd years after Jesus had died. Um, and this letter is written about 10 years later. So 10 years have elapsed since the church was founded, and then Paul dies not long after, about four or five years after that, in about AD 66. That's why introductions to the book, so anyway. Um, so rough, roughly there. So, and he was a man, he would have been a man of about 60, something like that. That's not far, coming to the end of his life. <clears throat> and uh, he writes from Rome, there are various options of where it could be written, but the consensus is from Rome, uh, when he was in prison, stroke under house arrest. Probably under house arrest, there was quite a lot of coming and going uh, with, um, from people. Uh, that's something of, a, of, the, of the setting. So this is, the, this is a letter from a spiritual father. The man who oversaw the birth of this church. He was the guy who saw Lydia come to Christ, Philippine Jaina come to Christ. He was the, he brought it to birth. You can have a male midwife, <laughs> mid-husband. <laughs> he, sort of, he was the guy who saw the birth of this church. Um, uh, and these are his dear children he's writing to. He writes with great affection. He loves them. Um, and uh, as he, I think every, every when, he, when he, well, whether he wrote it or whether he dictated it, it seems to have dictated most of his letters, some poor scribe, I need to sort of catch what he was saying. I didn't hear you, I don't spell it like that. I don't know what it would have been like being poor scribe. But anyway, uh, <coughs> this is from his heart. Uh, you know, we don't write letters that much now. Well, we do. We write emails. I mean, we go and we have texts. When did you last write a handwritten letter? Yes, on Thursday. On Thursday. Okay, well, since you say that, Celia and I both wrote a handwritten letter on Thursday. A dear friend of Celia, who she'd known for 50 years, died. Uh, we've known her husband for many years. We've been on holiday with him over the last couple of years. And so it was a loss. Uh, Steve was feeling the loss, but we knew our husband was feeling the loss. So we sat down and we, and we wrote a letter. And we thought, how can we... <coughs> I wrote mine several times. I need to get this right. Because this is a, this is a personal thing. I, I'm very fond of this guy. You know, I was feeling for him. I don't know if I got the, the words right, but the heart behind it was right. <laughs> and, and that's the sort of letter... And that's what we're dealing with as we look at, at, at the letter, I nearly said book, at, at the letter to the Philippians. Um, it's lovely. Um, and uh, in open, and this opening passage, he does what any good parent 
will do. He, he has three, he, well, I think he, three things he, he does. He, he, first of all, he encourages them. It's a very encouraging start. I thank God for you. Then he, the second thing he does, he says, I'm confident in the faith, and I'm confident he who began a good work in you will bring it to conclusion. And then he ends with a challenge that you love one another. Uh, and that's good parenting, I would say. Encouragement, confidence in the faith, but challenge as well. Young man, I don't want you here. You're going to grow up, to grow up in the Lord. Uh, that's what good parents do. Uh, and those three things are sort of touched um, in, in the letter. Okay, well, oh, sorry, I, I'm supposed to be doing this someday. <laughs> Gizmo, on. Oh, there you are. Uh, I just call this Let Love Abound, if you want the title. So, can we read it together? Paul, this is the ESV. Uh, first 11 verses. <clears throat> Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Just going to pause there. Ken, you got a moment? Ken, Ken woke up this morning, he was sharing this earlier, uh, and um, he just felt God sort of nudge him um, about something which uh, I, I felt I thought was rather helpful. So we can share with Ken. Not going to make it long. I uh, couldn't sleep well last night, and there was a thought that came into my head, and something I sort of thought about is how often people come to church, not specifically us, but just in general, come to church with the expectancy of what God can do for them, how God can heal them, how God can bless them, whether it's financially, whether it's you know all sorts of things. Um, where and I was thinking like why. I think we lack or, or we miss the point where we need to be doing the opposite of what we can do for God, how we can commit ourselves to God in service, whether that be in our workplace or um, in church, um, whatever it is. Um, yeah, I just, uh, the thought was, I just feel like the, the balance isn't there kind of a thing. I think often people just want to just keep being blessed and not being blessed in God in, in return, you know. So, yeah, that's a short Very good. Um, I think it's both, isn't it? God wants to touch us. He wants to heal us. He wants to set us free. But equally, he, we are servants, aren't we? We want to serve him. That's why. Did you notice how many Christ-centered songs <laughs> we sang this morning? It was great, wasn't it? Just to keep worshipping him. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, or for you all, making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. <clears throat> and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion of the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defence and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more, that with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. The wonderful song of love that Paul felt towards these folk. Um, just the first couple of verses, Paul often starts like this. He declares that Paul and Timothy are servants of Jesus Christ. We're servants. We're, he, we're obedient servants. We're not overlords. He writes to the saints in Christ Jesus. He says, all your salvation is, is him. All you need, past, pre present and future, is in Christ. Your lives are hidden in Christ. And then he declares, may grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be yours. May grace and peace be overflowing in your lives. Um, may you know the undeserved favour of God. That's the grace of God. 
And may you know the peace of God, the Hebrew word, the shalom of God, the wholeness of God in your lives. So he says, your, this is the, a servant of God writing to saints, sorry, a servant of Christ writing to saints in Christ, that they might have peace and grace from Christ. I love that. Totally Christ-centered. And actually, there's a lot of that in, in, um, <clears throat> in this book. This is a Christ-centered opening that reflects much of the book. One commentator says, it's no exaggeration to say that the letter is full of Christ. So when we sang all those songs to Jesus this morning, oh, yes, thank you. This is about him. This is about knowing him. This is about being in him. This is about receiving grace and peace from him. Um, and if you do, if you just quickly scan through. By the way, I would recommend you read the book, the letter. <laughs> I do recommend you read the letter. Read it several times. It won't take you very long. You can read it in about seven or eight minutes. Quite sure. And if you just scan through, you'll see, oh, it's Jesus, it's Christ there. You count it, it's about 40 times. I think Christ is mentioned in about three pages. Knowing Jesus was Paul's final obsession at the end of his life. You know, people get, when we're born again, oh, it's all about Jesus. Actually, it goes on being all about Jesus. I love that. Okay, that was his greeting. So, encouragement. What was my second thing? Um, confidence. And, uh, and challenge. So, number one, encouragement. <coughs> he begins, uh, he declares his gratitude for them. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Just thank God for you. <coughs> I love that. In my remembrance, when I think about you, when I think about the people of Philippi, he thinks about Lydia. He imagines her, he imagines her, her household, whatever that consisted of. And that rough old, tough old jailer who bathed our wounds. I remember, I remember you. So, what can we give her name? Claudius, maybe. I don't think he was a Jew. He remembers them with great affection. And uh, this is not sentimental nostalgia, it's genuine, I remember you with fond affection. Uh, and every, and it's deeply personal, he says, he talks about my God, my remembrance, my, uh, every prayer of mine, my prayer of joy. Uh, he remembered Lydia's hospitality. Remember, she opened her, she opened her home to them all. Come and stay here for a while, which they, which they did. She was a dealer in purple cloth. She might have been quite wealthy, so she might have been very generous. Uh, she might have met some of their financial needs at the time. Uh, and the, the way that the, way the jailer came to Christ, oh, I remember, you asked me, so what must I do to be saved? And we told you, and you came into a relationship with him. I think he picked a little Claudius, I guess, with his, with his, with his, with his family. Uh, uh, and, and the way God, do you remember the way God rescued us from that earthquake? Amazing. And uh, so praying for them is a joy. Praying for these people is a joy uh, for Paul. And, and when we pray for those we love, is it a joy? <laughs> is it a duty? Do I have to do it? Paul says, no, it's a joy to pray for those I love. And then he goes on, isn't it? I thank you also because of your partnership in the gospel from the first way day until till now. Because even the church has clearly grown at the beginning, there is a reference to elders and deacons, so by now they've got elders and deacons, there must be a reasonably sized church. I have a sort of feeling they were a church about the size of ours, 40, 50 foot, something like that, would be my guess. Maybe slightly more, no more than that. Meeting in a home, <coughs> quite a large home, or maybe in separate homes like we do. <coughs> Uh, but he's also grateful too for their partnership in the gospel because they provided a significant gift for him. When you get to chapter 4, we learn about that. Um, and also they stood in solidarity with Paul in his imprisonment, partakers of grace, um, both in my imprisonment and in defence and confirmation of the gospel, probably at his trial. Um, and, the, <clears throat> and they stood in solidarity with him. And for Paul, the spread of the gospel is never the work of just the evangelist or just the church planter. It's the work of every, it's a partnership. Um, it's a joint exercise. And Paul was very careful, actually, um, to be self-sufficient. He had his tent-making business, uh, which actually met his needs. He largely met his own needs. But there were occasions like this when he needed other people to support him. 
uh, which he did often hospitality and things like that. And when he traveled, he never traveled alone. He always traveled with other people. Uh, and in this letter, he mentions two people, Timothy and Epaphroditus, um, and uh, with, the, with the injunction to follow their example. Yeah. And where, well, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us in Castle Community Church? Uh, so I just had a simple question here. Will we be a church that partners in the gospel? Will we be the church that partners in the gospel? In other words, will we become a gospel church together, not just leaving it to leaders, or maybe we could import a good evangelist, which is great, and we might do that, uh, but will we be partners together? Will we seek to spread the gospel in this town and in this area? And I would simply say, do we have people that are praying for? <coughs> On a regular basis. Do we have people we're inter interacting with who don't know the Lord? on a regular basis. So I've had a happy couple of days this week interacting with my neighbour over mending a fence. I realised I've built two, two fences in my last house and I repaired one this time and I'm still in contact with those two people I've created a construction fence with. So I'm hoping this will be the same. He actually works with them uh, with Andy, as it so happens. <laughs> um, so, have we got people that we're involved with, we're engaging with, and, and uh, if the answer is no, don't go into a rabbit hole and feel condemned, but actually, are there friends that got out of there, friendship, new friendship God wants me to have, and are there people who don't know him that he wants us to reach out to? In a couple of weeks' time, the, there's, a, there's a sort of, there's a, the, the Cheltenham are doing a, a, a monthly service, they're going to start a monthly service, and they're simply asking, anybody want to be part of a renter crowd? to come and help us establish something in, 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 Castle, in, uh, in Cheltenham. Starting a church with a dozen people is jolly hard work. I can tell you from experience. We had slightly more, actually, last week. Um, but it's hard work. So can we partner with them? Swindon as well, they, they've got a little church then, there. It's a partnership. Um, and I know Richard and Anna have got a heart for churches working together. Let's do this together. We're a partnership with other churches in the preaching of the gospel and the outworking of the gospel. Uh, so <clears throat> that's, a, that's, a, that's our first challenge, I think, for the, for out of this, out of this, 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 um, this opening chapter. I'm not going to ask you to give me an answer back, but you might want to think about that. The Philippians were our partners, they worked together. Secondly, Paul's confidence. He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Or the NIV says, um, I am being confident of this, that he who began a good work. <coughs> Paul knew the ground on which he stood. Um, and uh, and he, he tried to co convince these people, listen, what we did 10 years ago, what we started 10 years ago, listen, God started something then. <laughs> yes, they preached, they preached the gospel, if you like. They, um, they were there um, actually articulating the gospel. <clears throat> but actually, when Lyd and Lydia made a decision for Christ outside the city at the point of prayer, but... The text said, the Lord opened her heart to respond or pay attention to Paul's message. What's going on there? Paul's message was given, but the Lord opened her heart. God was doing something for her. God was doing something. She was ready, if you like, to hear the gospel. So was the jailer. When you heard the gospel at a moment when you thought this makes sense, <coughs> Have you ever wondered if that was God opening your heart? Or were you just making a decision? God was doing something in her. When we came to Christ, God was involved in that. Yes, we assented, but God was stirring something in our hearts. <clears throat> John Wesley, when he refers back to his conversion as a meeting in London, said, my heart was strangely warm. I love that. I can't quite get 
John went, I can't quite work out what was going on. It was strange, but my heart was warm. And that was the moment he came to Christ. And he started a relationship <coughs> with, with Before that, he'd done a whole load of religious activity down the road in Oxford. That's where the, he had a certain method. That's when the idea of method, that's where the name came from. But he himself didn't come to Christ until a few years later, after an abject failure in America. <laughs> he sort of, God softened him up. Oh, I need God. I need Christ. I need a relationship with Christ. And something with God inside him. And Paul is saying here, if you will make Jesus Christ the priority in your life, then God will do wonderful things. Later on in chapter 3, he says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. Knowing Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus, that's what makes, my, makes sense of my life. Even not long before he died, after him a lifetime of very successful ministry said, well, that's not important, it's knowing Christ. That matters. That's what matters. And the same is, and, and, uh, and the same is, you know, is, is true for us today. We might, <coughs> you know, what God began in us individually, what God began in us in the church, he will bring to completion. And, uh, and I wonder whether there are some in, in Philippi who needed to hear this. <coughs> they were in difficulty, maybe. There was a lot of opposition. It wasn't straightforward. And he need, they needed Dad to come along and say, I'm sure that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. I think some of them needed to hear that in the difficulty they were facing. And maybe there are some this morning. I, and actually, we need to hear it. Father Paul as well. He began a good work in your life. We'll bring it to completion until the day of Christ. It will be complete when Christ returns. I think there's a fair chance that most of us will die before Jesus returns, although we have to live as if we won't. <laughs> that means God will work until the day we die. Yeah? yeah, God was going to go on working in our lives until the day we die. For some of us, that's nearer than for some of the others. I find that a great comfort and a great encouragement. If God's God's not given up on you. You might sometimes give up on God, but God's not given up on you. you know, it's a little verse in, in Timothy that says, "If we are faithless, He remains faithful." You ever thought of that? Those moments when we've let our faith drift. Or it's just too difficult. There's a faithful God watching over us. Until we return to him. Because faithfulness is his character. And we sang about it this morning. I can remember a time a few years ago when, when I was at quite a low ebb. You know, my confidence had been shaken. And I was in a gathering at the end of which I've been involved in. At the end of the gathering, um, somebody came up to me and said, John, I just feel God wants to say to you, the best is yet to come. Now I know that means when I go to heaven, but I, I, think, I think what she was saying is, there's more, John, for you to do. Do you know, I needed to hear that. At that moment, I needed to hear that. So when we had lunch the other day, John and um, the police with Bryn Franklin, he said, John, I've just got a word for you. The best is yet. God doesn't give up on us. God's not going to give up on us. God's got work to do in us. And in the discomfort of your life, maybe that might be God working. In the blessings of your life, that might be God nourishing you. But that's the relationship with God. We remain faith. We are faithless. He remains faithful. And what was Paul's motive? He goes on in verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace. He holds them in his heart. This is not sentimentality. It really is. This is people who he's worked with and loved and prayed for over the years who have a place in his heart. 
and he's trying to communicate that to them. Um, and uh, Paul is saying, um, you know, <laughs> I know you really well, Philippians. I know God really well. <laughs> and my God is working in you. This is going to give up. I think that's a really encouraging. And, uh, and, and, the same, and the same encouragement is, us, is for us that we don't give up on God because he doesn't give up on us. The confidence that Paul, exp Paul expresses here, I think, is a great encouragement for us to, to keep going, to keep trusting God, to say there is more that God wants to do in us as a church and in us as a, individually, because he's the God who works in our lives. And God working in our lives speaks of discipleship, doesn't it? It's actually our behaviour changing, our attitudes changing, to become in conform to God. And that speaks of discipleship. So my challenge here is, um, will we give ourselves to the process of becoming good disciples of Jesus, of allowing God to work in our lives through the circumstances of our lives, through the blessings of our lives, through the challenges of our lives, that we become more like him. Because it will come a time when Christ Jesus returns when it's done. The work in Matt is done. Jesus returned. Jesus, leave Matt. The work I did in him is done. Jesus turns and says, Well done, good faithful servant. I'm looking well, I'm looking forward to the, the sun, <laughs> the reshaping of my life being done. And being presented to Christ. Yes. So will we give ourselves to that process? And thirdly, Paul's challenge. I've got to say, for God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. That's all that, that statement. <laughs> Paul yearns for them with all the affection of Christ Jesus. That's quite a statement, isn't it? All the love I have in Christ, uh, that's how I feel about you, is what he said. And, uh, uh, and that's the selfless, sacrificial, your good at my expense love that Christ shows the world through his life and through his death and through his resurrection. And that's the sort of affection that Paul has got a hold of. And we, I believe, gradually through our lives, as our lives go on, and we face versions, various things, the nature of love, um, the agape nature of love, uh, begins to dawn on us. That's why he says, um, I want you, my prayer is that you may, your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. In other words, I, I pray that you will understand what agape love is all about. That you'll, you'll get hold of it with all knowledge. <clears throat> that you'll really understand what it is. Uh, and, uh, and Paul is saying, the love that Jesus showed me in his life, death, death and resurrection, he, he appeared to me on the road to Damascus, that's the love I have for you, and that's the love I'm urging you to express to one another. Yeah? So Paul is saying the affection of Christ, the self, the, the, the self giving, sacrificial, your good at my expense, other people's benefit, love. <laughs> That's the love I'm urging you to learn to exhibit with all knowledge and with all discernment. Yeah? <laughs> I wonder what that sort of love looks like. I wonder if the Philippians sort of understood what that's maybe why Paul prayed. <laughs> I pray they understand this. Be, God, God will give them discernment and understanding. And, and uh, <clears throat> so, in, in having knowledge of love, it's understanding the nature of love. Discernment is knowing how to apply it. He says that they might have, uh, my prayer is that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, so that you may know what to do. I think he's saying, if your motive is love, you'll know what to do. Yeah? How do I treat this person? Well, what does love look like? <laughs> what do I do in this particular situation that I'm in? 
Well, what does self-giving, sacrificial, Jesus type love look like? It probably means I've got to put the other person first. Yeah? And I pray, boy, I pray they'll understand this. Okay, well, <laughs> we need to receive God's prayer, Paul's prayer as well. And, uh, and, and he goes on, doesn't he? Uh, so that you may prove what is excellent, so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. So that the, your motives might be pure. If your motive is, if your motive is love, then the purity of heart will follow. You know? Motives are such a funny thing, aren't they? I don't, we sometimes don't know our own motives. I sometimes I think, and when did I really, why did I really do that? Was it for my benefit? Really? Secret? Underneath? And when you ever, ever have those thoughts? Well, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll try and do that as well. <laughs> that's, that's about it. Uh, my, my, my sister and I visited an, an elderly aunt of mine like, earlier this week. She's my father's sister. She's 90. She's in hospital and she's in Cornwall. And uh, my sister and I have very small. We really should go and visit her, shouldn't we? Yes, we should. But A, it's a long way. And B, she has Alzheimer's, so it's really quite tricky. <laughs> we sort of, uh, she might not recognise us and we won't be appreciated, so should we go? And in the end, we think, no, we won't go. And on the way back, we thought, well, what was all, again, it wasn't very easy, I have to say, but it was difficult. And on the way back, we were talking, he said, what was all that about? And I said, well, I don't know, it was a mixture, it was duty. But actually, it was an attempt at love, if you would. It was an attempt, probably a pretty feeble one, but it was an attempt. And, and it's a bit like that sometimes, isn't it? Actually, sometimes there's this funny mixture of obligation and love. But Paul is saying, "I pray they'll understand this, and I pray we will." Um, good, I mean, look, and, and then you're, if your motives are pure, then your actions blameless. It's what the good Samaritan did. And then he finishes, doesn't he? So that you all may prove what is excellent, so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. It comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. That as we operate out of love, this fruit begins to grow in our lives. The fruit of righteousness. That's the righteousness that comes by faith, justification by faith, this gift of righteousness that we receive. But there's fruit as well love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, da -da 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 -da, and self control. <laughs> Never remember them all. That's part of the fruit. Of, of walking in righteousness, I believe, out of love. Now, I'm trying to receive Paul's prayer here. I'm not trying to say, I've got it, now you do it, because <laughs> I know I haven't. <laughs> I'm trying to receive, imagine God's praying. I pray that John, <clears throat> his love would abound more and more with all knowledge and discernment. Okay, I'll accept that. I think that's the same for us. And it's a lifetime's work. It's a lifetime's work. But at the end, to the glory and praise of God. To the end, to the glory and praise of God. When God's people are moving in love, acting in love, have learned something of love. Ah, God must be pretty good to these guys. We sang that song, didn't we? Jesus be glorified in all things, in all my life. Lovely line that we sang this morning. So, the Father Paul is exhorting his precious saints to abound more and more in love. So what does this mean for us? <laughs> what does this mean for us? Will we do all we can to ensure that love abounds more and more amongst us? That might be, that might be in practical ways, very practical ways. <coughs> Meals that need to be cooked. DIY that, if you've got reasonable ability, would be a help. In other words, if you're gym, you're useful. If you're me, you're probably not. <laughs> Practical stuff. Um, visiting each other's homes. Making connection with, with, with when friends are struggling. Whether it's a note or an arm around the shoulder. Um, 
And in, in life groups, do you know, in life groups is the best place for our love for one another to be expressed. Because it's flesh and blood. They're in the, they're in the room together. Like, Adam, I had a good time this week. And, you know, it's, it's by being there, giving to one another, praying together, reading the scriptures together, encouraging together, all those things that you can't do unless you're in the room together. I mean, I mean, the online stuff was fine during COVID. In fact, it rescued us. We were stuck having around Zoom meeting. And, and, and Zoom meetings are good practically, but, but there was something about, there's something about being with people, isn't it? It was different. But there's a difference between Kindle and a book. I like the feel of a book. And I can go back and look at the previous page, but actually Kindle's quite useful. You know, if I'm in a room with Matt and I can see there's something in his eye that says he's not right, I will miss that. I might miss that online. But I can go to him. And... Okay. I was listening to a talk. It's actually on the Whitney Community Church YouTube. It's a lady there called Sarah Fanner. She did a brilliant talk a couple of weeks ago on loving one another. She really did. And, and she was saying, she was talking about life groups, and she said it made a really good statement which I've never heard before. Life goes on and sometimes it's great, we congratulate each other, that's wonderful, but actually sometimes life is tough. And it isn't. In your life group, you'll find your lifeboat. And then she went on. I said, Hang on, what have you just said? In your life group is your lifeboat. In other words, there are people who know you and love you well, who can help you and stand alongside you and be with you. I thought that was rather good. Actually. And last week, when we were struggling with the, the, the loss of a friend, and we texted the, the stewards, Ali, Sheree, and said, Would you pray for us? We're struggling a bit here. Uh, and I'm thinking, actually, we need to do more, <laughs> not less of it. We need to do more of it. That relationship grows, and the trust grows. And I'd encourage us to do that. There's an encouragement. There's a um, confidence that Paul brings, and there's a, a challenge. So I just want to end with a couple of stories. Um, Sarah, who I mentioned, she said an interest, she, when she was introducing a talk about love, she said she's seen a telly program recently about the brain. Is anybody interested in the brain, how the brain, how the brain works? I know, I know some people, it's really, really, both their both. Isaac, okay, this is good for you. Anyway, they did an experiment. And what they did, they got people to plunge their head under water, hold it there for as long as they could, and then they get paid for it. But they couldn't keep the money, they had to give it away. They, they said it was fascinating, because I mean, they began by saying, well, okay, you give it to somebody in the town who's suffering, who's got, I don't know, a sick child or something, um, and they yeah, I'll hold my breath under it. And they gradually brought the relationships closer and closer and closer until it was your, well, your wife or your husband or your father or your sister or your daughter or your brother. And what do you think might have happened? They held it. People held their head under the water for longer, apparently, which in one sense you would expect. But I think what she was trying to, what the film was trying to communicate, and more than that, there was something physiological going on. Well, something extra was going on that people would hold their way head under, under the water longer for a family member, somebody they're close, they're close to. And then she went on to say, the church is compared to a family, but the church is not like a family. The church is a family. <laughs> and so she was making the point, we're commanded to love one another. And sometimes that means holding your head under the water, <laughs> or metaphorically. And the ones you really love, you travel to the other side of the world to buy an air ticket to go and see I'm pointing at Ken because she's just on that. And I would love to do it. <laughs> I found that a really helpful illustration of agape love. Of selfless, holding your head under the water for, for somebody else. And then, uh, uh, just another story which, which occurred to which involved Celia and I many, many years ago. Celia mainly. We know our first uh, cast and um, incarnation. Uh, we moved here in 1982. Uh, Celia had 
bright red hair. In fact, quite a mane of bright red hair. That's why I married him. <laughs> that was a, a bonus of mar marrying him. It came in a package. <laughs> When we moved, we, we, just, we just attempted too much at once. We got a new house, we had a new baby, Richard was on the way, we had a new baby. I just got a new job. We were part of a new church. I even bought a new car. Anyway, Richard was born a few months later. All his hair fell out. And it came back white. So you've only known white hair. I, I knew it was red hair. It was quite distressing <coughs> for her. I just thought, well, it's time to pick up then, and I was, I was not impressed by that. But, but see, was only saying, and he you know, like a couple of weeks ago, Bryn Franklin, who came and had that great morning, he was the pastor here when he was prophesying over us a couple of weeks ago. See, was saying, you know what, every couple of weeks there'd be a knock at the door, and Bryn would be there. How are you doing? And just, just passing, I thought I'd drop in. See, would probably say, well, what's his name last week, Brett? <laughs> okay. And sometimes he'd come with his wife. But Steve was just reminding us, you know, when I think back over all that time, that, that really helped. That was a tangible expression of like a big love. And, uh, you know, we, we live in a different time now, don't we? We have lots of technical stuff, all of which is great. Um, but it's that, <coughs> if you like, it, it, it's that, it's the hand on the shoulder. It's that. I've just trodden on her toe. <laughs> It's our armour up. <coughs> and I encourage us that maybe that's, a, maybe that's something on the way. Anyway, something we probably let go of, to be honest. We could do more. Like a bail off. Sorry, I've gone on ten minutes longer than I meant to. I'm not sure what to do now, but I pray. <laughs> Um, I, I do feel actually there are some of us who need to hear this morning God's at work in your life. He began a good work in you. We'll bring it to completion and is working. Father, I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you that you're working in our lives and uh, you're working in my life. I thank you for that, Lord. And I thank you that you're working in, in the lives of others. And Father, I thank you for that. And I thank you, Lord, for this amazing love that Paul got a hold of and sought to communicate to the saints of Philippi. And I pray, Lord, help us to get hold of something of that. We all recognise we've got a way to go. But Lord, your sacrificial, self-giving love that doesn't expect anything in return, help us, I pray. To understand that, to get a hold of it, and to express it that it might land within us as a company of people and other people.